The day is February 6, 1952, a day that would change the life of a young, newly married English princess forever. Being on an official royal tour with her husband in East Africa, Her Royal Highness, 25-year-old Princess Elizabeth, was watching baboons while taking photographs of the Kenyan sunrise from a hotel set in the branches of a giant fig tree. The hotel to this day is called Treetops Hotel and it is one heck of a magical place. But back to our princess. Within hours, Her Royal Highness Princess Elizabeth was to become the world's most powerful monarch because back in the UK, her father, His Majesty the ailing King George VI, died in the early hours of that morning at Sandringham. Elizabeth and her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, had spent the night at the remote Treetops Hotel, which is only accessible via a hanging bridge that leads between the canopies of camphor and cedar trees in the Aberdeer Forest and ends at a ladder which has to be navigated to access the hotel's reception area. On that morning, the princess and her duke climbed up to a lookout point at the top of the tree to see the dawn breaking and to watch the baboons in the jungle. The Duke's equerry and friend, Mike Parker, was at the Queen's side at the lookout when they spotted an eagle hovering overhead. Years later, he is known to have said, and I quote, I never thought about it until later, but that was roughly the time when the King died. Lady Pamela Hicks, who was the Queen's lady-in-waiting, and also Philip's cousin, said, The Queen and the Duke were the last people in the world to hear that the King had died. Secret ciphers were sent by the British Embassy to the Governor announcing the King's death, but the coded messages could not be read as the key to the code was nowhere to be found. When the news finally filtered through to royal aides, unbeknownst to her, the now Queen Elizabeth was resting later at Zagana Lodge, a wedding present from the people of Kenya. The Queen's private secretary, Martin Charteris, was in the nearby town having a drink in a restaurant when a writer approached him and informed him of the news that the King had died. Returning to the lodge, he told Mr. Parker, who went to the room where the Queen was at her desk. He motioned to the Duke of Edinburgh and secretly turned on the radio very low to get confirmation but prevent the Queen finding out this way. It allowed Philip to convince the Queen to go for some fresh air in the garden, and there he broke the sad news to his wife while they were alone, telling her as they walked slowly up and down the lawn. Afterwards, Lord Charteris remembered seeing the new monarch seated at her desk in the lodge appearing, and I quote, very composed, absolute master of her fate, and ready to fulfill the role for which she had been carefully groomed. Asked what name she wished to use as queen, she replied simply, My own name, of course. Just hours later, the monarch and her consort were on their way back home. Lord Charteris and Mr. Parker had packed up, worked out timetables, sent a flood of signals, organized a plane at Entebbe in Uganda, another from Mombasa in Kenya, to get there, and timed a London airport arrival for 4 p.m. the following day. With the king's health failing when they had left home, a royal standard had been stowed in the baggage. Her Majesty's mourning clothes, waiting for her in Entebbe, were prepared for her to wear. It was dusk on February 7, 1952, when a slim pale figure, dressed in mourning black, descended the steps of the jet airliner. After a long journey home, the young new queen set foot on English soil, the runway at London Airport, for the first time as sovereign. I have been to treetops many, many times from when I was a Kidogo Toto until just before I left to continue my studies in Germany. The presence of Her Majesty was scattered all throughout Kenya and many of the British habits and traditions are still being carried out and respected to this day. Treetops is a magical place. And knowing that Kenya has its place in the history of the British monarchy to this day makes me proud. I was not around when she heard that she was now the queen and made that famous speech proclaiming duty for the remainder of her life while still on Kenyan soil. It just makes me proud that my country of birth had the queen before anyone else. Even though she clearly had to cut her tour of the Commonwealth short, she became queen in Kenya. Just want to give a little tidbit of additional information about the continued connection that Kenya has with Britain to this day. 
Kenya was initially known as the British East Africa Protectorate, or British East Africa. When it declared its independence from Britain on December 12, 1963, it changed its name to Kenya, after the mountain of the same name, Mount Kenya. The Kikuyu people who live around Mount Kenya refer to it as Kirinyaga or Kerenyaga, meaning mountain of whiteness because of its snow-capped peak. Mount Kirinyaga, which was the main landmark, became synonymous with the territory the British later claimed as their colony. However, the name Kenya arose out of the inability of the British to pronounce Kirinyaga correctly. Her Majesty returned to independent Kenya in 1972. I was six years old. Apparently it was a big deal. I wouldn't know. I was probably on deck of a ship, painting away. But she returned in November 1983, and I was in the throngs of people lining the road to cheer and welcome her on her drive from Joma Kenyatta Airport in Nairobi to the city centre. The then president, Daniel Turoitich Arap Moy, hosted Her Majesty from November 10th to 14th in 1983. While subsequent political relationships between Kenya and Britain were always rife with tension, President Moy fell in love with Britain when Kenya was still struggling with pre-independence nation building, and that love persisted to the independence period when key players in Kenyan politics were in Lancaster writing the independence constitution. He was so impressed by the mother country that he named his twins Philip and Doris Elizabeth in honour of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. It was under the pressure of the British government that Kenya became a multi-party state. However, the love and respect for Her Majesty was always a constant and the Kenyan people were fond of her. She was revered. It was clear that she was not the source of the tension. On the contrary, she was the foundation of the continued connection between Kenya and Britain. The Kenyan people, being hard-working and dutiful people in their own right, appreciated that the Queen displayed these character traits and she garnered a lot of respect because she put duty before herself. And despite the tensions, 12 months after gaining independence, Kenya joined the Commonwealth and to this day remains committed to its ideals and objectives. I doubt very much that Kenya will change everything that still bears the late Queen's coat of arms, Elizabeth Regina II, to Charles Rex III. But whatever changes Kenya makes, doesn't make, or feels appropriate to make, the now Prince of Wales proposed to the now Princess of Wales in Kenya. So the ties continue and we are loving it. Today I join millions around the world to mourn the loss of Her Majesty, to celebrate a most extraordinary life of service and duty, and to say thank you, ma'am, and Godspeed. Asante sana for your service to Kenya, Your Majesty. Thank you for your service to the world. May you rest in peace. Long live the King. <laughs>